Matthew chapter 4 this morning. Matthew chapter 4. We're going to be looking at the last few verses of chapter 4. This is going to actually kick off a series of sermons that are going to begin next Sunday, which will be the first Sunday in the new year of 2020. And it's not just the new year of 2020, but if you read the uh, newsletter, has the newsletter been sent out yet? Has it? Yes, no, no, yes, I don't know. But um, I've written in the um, newsletter that this is also a new decade that we're going to be looking at in the year uh, uh, in the millennium of 2000. And so it's going to be 2020 starting a new decade. And so with all of these things that are beginning new, uh, Jesus' ministry at the end of Matthew chapter 4 is new. He's just beginning to preach. He's just beginning the story, if you will, as it continues after Bethlehem. As it's going to move from Nazareth to another city that will be soon his base of operation. A city that is called Capernaum. And from there, he and his disciples will operate their base of operation. They will move from Capernaum down through Samaria and then into the land of Judea, moving toward Jerusalem where Christ will eventually be crucified. Even the music this morning speaks about how that the story continues. We sang a song that reminds us of what happened at Bethlehem. But most, and I've shared this before from the pulpit, most of us don't really think about it. But Joy to the World is not really a Christmas song. It's not a Christmas song at all. When you look at the words of Joy to the World, it's not talking about what the angels sang or said. It's not talking about what Mary and Joseph experienced in Bethlehem. This is talking about a returning king. This is talking about a rejuvenated and a revitalized world. Joy to the world speaks about when Christ comes the second time. It is a song about the second coming. I mean, when you think about the words, No more let sin nor sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings known far as the curse is found. That's talking about a removal of the curse. That comes when Jesus Christ returns. And comes back and sits upon the throne of David in Jerusalem. And so for that song to happen, the story has to continue. It has to move on. And that's what the Bible speaks about here in Matthew chapter 4, in verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. and His fame went throughout all of Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers or different or many diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic or insane or had Uh, uh, mental uh, problems and those that had the palsy or those that were paralyzed and he healed them and there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan last week I shared with you as I preached on the topic of the story that there are only a very few select scriptures that tell us about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Very select few. It's mentioned just a few times. But when the Bible tells us that Jesus began his earthly ministry, and this started at the age of 30, and the reason that it started at the age of 30, for a Hebrew man, a Jewish man, to become not just a priest, But the high priest, he had to be 30. He had to be 30 years of age. And so Jesus, as Paul would write later on in the book of Hebrews, so that he becoming our great high priest, 
that he had to fit within those parameters of not only being of Jewish descent, but also the correct age, so that the Bible then, when it says that in Christ, all things, all the scriptures, all the law had been fulfilled, this too had to be fulfilled. But preaching, preaching, Brother Todd, what God called you to do, and what God called me to do, preaching, that's found in the scriptures 145 times. And 134 of those times you find specifically in the New Testament, Paul wrote that God has chosen that through the foolishness of preaching that folks would be saved. Now he said, now listen to the Gentiles, it's foolishness. That's what Paul found out on Mars Hill there in Athens where he spoke to those Epicureans and Stoics and they mocked him and made fun of him and said, Paul, great story talking to us about some guy that lived and died and was buried and rose again. Man, that was a good story, good story. If we ever need to hear it again, we need another laugh. Uh, dude, we'll, we'll give you another call. And you come out and you talk to us about uh, this resurrected living Savior. You talk to us by the name of Jesus. To the Gentiles, it's foolishness. To the Jews, Paul wrote, it's a stumbling block. He didn't come from the right tribe. Wasn't from the right family. As far as we're concerned, we don't care if he's 10, 20, 30, 40, or 140. We question this man's parentage. We know he was born from a Jewish girl, Mary. But about his father, we have some questions. And so the preaching of Jesus to the Jew was a stumbling block. But to those of us who are born again, who know Christ as our Savior, who will partake of the Lord's Supper this morning because we know what He did for us on the cross. To those of us who believe in what He did for us, it's the power of God. And that's where we find it. And this methodology, if you will, of the Lord Jesus Christ that began here in Galilee and His preaching of the kingdom gospel was so impactful not only to lives and when we began looking at the Beatitudes we're going to think about the throngs that he preached to. It was so impactful not only to these people in Galilee but to one apostle in particular by the name of Peter. That seven years after Jesus rose from the dead and returned to heaven and Peter was called by the Holy Spirit to go to a city by the name of Joppa and speak to a family who the head of that household was a Roman soldier by the name of Cornelius. That when he's speaking and preaching to the family of Cornelius, Peter said this in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good. Now I want you to notice it said he went about just like it says here in verse 23 and Jesus went about and he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. See, the story didn't end in Bethlehem. The story didn't end with the shepherds or the wise men or the song of Anna or the prayer of Simeon in the temple. It didn't end there. It didn't end with a 12 year old boy who wound up missing in action and was found by his parents in the temple asking the doctors and the lawyers questions and then them asking him questions at the age of 12 didn't end there. The story continues 
and it continues today as well. The first thing I want you to look at this morning, you find in verse 23. In verse 24, the last portion, verse 24, and verse 25. And that is his industry. Jesus was not a lazy preacher. His industry, he went about. The Bible says that he was proactive. See, this is his activity. Those first six words that you find there in verse 23, and Jesus went about all Galilee, set the stage for how his ministry will be conducted for the next three years. Jesus went about preaching the story. Through the story came the storyteller who told the story about the love of God that was shown to mankind through the gift of the Son and how that the gospel can transform the lives of not only those who hear the gospel, but those who receive the gospel. He wasn't lazy. He went about Galilee. He was not about avoiding his public responsibility to the people. Jesus went about Galilee. His industry was his inspiration. His industry was his inspiration. He knew that those folks needed to hear the story. And just kind of give you an idea, because a lot of folks, you know, and the devil may even be telling you this morning, well, Galilee ain't that big. Israel was divided up in three parts. Galilee to the north, Samaria sandwiched between them, and then Judea to the south. And so Galilee wasn't that big. But if you go and you look and you research the cities, the towns, and villages of Galilee in the days of Jesus Christ, there were more than 200. He was busy going about, as Peter said, doing good. He, uh, Romans chapter 10 and verse 15 says, And how are they to preach unless they are sent? For as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. He went about. This was his activity. Here is his approach. Now this is important, church. I don't want, if, if you don't get nothing else this morning, this is what I want you to get. He says, in their synagogues. Teaching in their synagogues. Here's what Jesus did not do. Jesus did not go to Jerusalem. Rent a venue. Put out flyers and posters. And say Jesus Christ the carpenter from Nazareth. The son of Joseph. Will be holding an evangelistic rally. For the next five to six to seven days. So and so is going to sing. So and so is going to give testimonies. So and so is going to do this. So and so is going to do that. Now we're putting all this on now. Now you come to us. That is not what Jesus did. The Bible said Jesus went to where they were. He went to their synagogue. He did not expect the people to come to him. Listen, if there was ever a man that had the right to issue a proclamation that all who wanted to hear the good news, all who wanted to hear the gospel, all who wanted a change in their lives should come to him. And that man would have been Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. That's not what he did. He went about Galilee. He went into their synagogues. He went to where the people were. He went to their towns, their villages. He went to their cities. He went to them. He went to them with the three things that would impact the people with who this man is and what this man would be. First of all, the Bible tells us that he taught in their synagogues. Now, synagogues began at the end of the 70-year captivity period in the days of Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, when Nebuchadnezzar, after he had taken the Israelites captive for 70 years, that Cyrus the king, 
issued a proclamation that the Jews could be set free and would return to Jerusalem to build their temple and rebuild their city. And the moment that those scribes and priests came back to Israel, after 70 years, they began to build synagogues, which is their form of the local church. Well, why would they build synagogues? Brother Dale, after they'd been in Babylon for 70 years, they forgot how to be Jews. Somebody had to teach them how to be Jews again. Somebody had to teach them the law. Somebody had to teach them the scriptures. Somebody had to read to them from the book of Isaiah and remind them that as they returned to Jerusalem, that God would also send his Messiah as he had promised. It was in the synagogues where the citizens would gather and the Old Testament scriptures were read and taught from. It was in the synagogues where the minds of the people. And listen, if you come here this morning and your mind's on anything else other than receiving the engrafted word of the scriptures, you're getting ready to be robbed. You're getting ready to be mugged. You're getting ready to be stolen from. Because when you come to God's house, we want the minds of the people to be prepared to receive the gospel into their minds if they're saved, into their hearts if they're not. You must be prepared. That ground's got to be broken. And that's where these folks went to because that's what happened in the synagogue. And as Solomon wrote in the book of Proverbs, that this is where that wisdom would cry out and that her voice would be lifted up and that she would be listened to by the people in the chief places. The second thing was not only did he teach in their synagogues, but he preached the gospel of the kingdom. Now, I've had several folks over the years to ask me, what exactly is the gospel of the kingdom? And here's what it is. Jesus is proclaiming on earth, and if you remember last week, that I told you that the birth of Jesus Christ came during Rome's heyday. It was in the days of Caesar Augustus, their most popular and most powerful of Caesars. It was the fourth monarchy of Rome. It was their most prosperous of monarchies. And a king invaded their world. The kingdom gospel is to remind the world that a greater kingdom is now on the scene. A greater king than Israel or than Augustus now walks through Israel. A more powerful voice now speaks than does a procurator as was Pontius Pilate, or as was a Caesar, as was Augustus. The greatest is there, and the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection is literally the charter of that kingdom. The gospel, the kingdom gospel, is literally a proclamation of a coronation. We have a king here. And he is to be recognized. And he will one day be crowned. There's a song that is in our hymn books. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem. And crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. To him who saved you by his grace, crown him Lord of all. This is the coronation of a king. This is the Lamb of God that John the Baptist proclaimed. will take away the sin 
of the world. And this is where this king literally obligates himself. Brother Todd, he obligates himself to pardon, to protect, and to save the subjects of his kingdom. No one could save the Babylonians from the Medes and the Persians. No one could save the Medes and the Persians from the Greeks. And no one could save the Greeks from the Romans. And no one will save Rome from the kingdom of heaven in King Jesus. He promises, obligates himself to save us through his grace. Isaiah wrote, of this kingdom there will be no end. And the chief proclamator, the chief preacher, is a man by the name of Jesus Christ. And he preaches not about someone else, Brother Kent. He preaches about himself. It don't get no more powerful than that. That is what the kingdom gospel is. And that is where our faith is confirmed and settled in Him and in Him alone. David wrote in Psalm 103, verses 1, 2, and 3, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, and who healeth. All thy diseases. Thirdly, Jesus healed their sicknesses and their diseases. That word healed literally means to wait upon. It's the same concept, if you will. These folks have been waiting to be healed. They've been waiting for the Messiah. They've been waiting for this man. To be healed means to wait upon it's the same concept as that woman that the Bible tells us who had the issue of blood for 12 years. That she had gone to every doctor that she knew about. She spent every penny that she had in the bank. And the Bible says that she grew no better, but instead she grew the worse. And she heard that Jesus was coming. See, Jesus went about. He didn't look and say, woman, if you want to be healed, you got to come over here where I'm at. No. She heard Jesus was coming. And she said inside of herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. Let me tell you something this morning, folks. This king who's so powerful, who heals all your sicknesses, who heals all of your diseases, is that powerful? And if you but touch the hem of his garment, he'll make you whole. It's where we get our word therapy. It means to relieve. But it also means to adore. It means to adore. Let me tell you something. If Jesus Christ can forgive you of your sins and heal you of your iniquities and your infirmities and you don't adore him, the problem is not him. The problem's with us. Adoration. Is that what we do to Jesus when we worship? We adore him because we know that apart from him, we had absolutely no hope. These folks, if Jesus hadn't have come and was going throughout Galilee, they'd have been a people without no hope. But because he went about, because this was his industry, this was his approach. It's like Mark Lowry wrote in that song, Mary, did you know? The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again. The lame will leap. The dumb shall speak. 
the praises of the Lamb. Mary, did you know? The demon possessed were healed. The insane were once again given their right mind, just like that maniac of Gadara that the Bible says that nobody could bind, nobody could control, nobody could get under control. Nobody. But as soon as Jesus came on the scene and Jesus healed him, he was clothed, sitting at the feet of Jesus and in his right mind. The paralyzed will walk. I think about my cousin Grady. He was born, never walked a day in his life. But when he went to glory, he didn't drag himself with his knuckles on his backside through the gates of heaven. And I'll bet you $100 he didn't walk neither. I guarantee you he ran to the feet of Jesus. See, the paralyzed will walk. All kinds of diseases were relieved, and they adored him, and they followed him from Galilee. The capitalist was a ten city area, region, if you will, that was in Syria. Those folks from Judea and from Jerusalem and beyond the Jordan followed him. Isaiah chapter 35, verses 4, 5, and 6 say, Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, and even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. And then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. His infamy, I want you to look. At the first portion of verse 24, and we'll close right here. His fame went throughout all of Syria. See, this is his prominence. This man basically had lived in mystery, veiled, if you will, until the appointed time. But for the next three years, his fame will go throughout all of Israel in the region. The Bible says that when Jesus was brought to Herod before he was crucified, that Herod had heard about Jesus. And he wanted to meet him and wanted to see him. Nicodemus in John chapter 3 said, We know that you've come from God because no man can do the things that you've done except God sent him. His fame went throughout the region. The miracles of the Messiah for the next three years were expected. But would they come from this man? A carpenter of questionable parentage. In John chapter 7 verse 31 the Bible says, Yet many of the people believed in him and they said, When the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man's done? Even the man who had been born blind told the Pharisees and the Sadducees, there's never been a man whose sight was restored that was born blind except from this man. This mysterious man, is it him? And all the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? Matthew chapter 12. This miracle worker who literally came out of nowhere. And I mean Galilee is nowhere. I've talked to folks who said, boy, I live out in the boondocks. Let me tell you something. Galilee was nowhere. Galilee was a questionable place. It was right along the border where the trade routes were. And there was such a mingling of the Galileans with the, uh, the nations and other people that they spoke Aramaic. And when Nathaniel was told, said, well, well we found him. And Nathaniel said, well, who is he? He said, well, he's Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel said, man, can anybody that's any good even come out of that area? The high priest even said, has there ever a prophet come out of Galilee? Proved his ignorance there had, but that was their attitude. But he came out of Galilee. 
Would this be the place? Would he be the source? Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they didn't confess it. For they feared that they would be put out of the synagogue. Who will believe that this story continues? Many came to him and they said, John did no sign. But everything that John said about this man was true. See, here's we still have Christmas in our thoughts and our minds. And we ask folks about whether or not they had a good Christmas or not. As we remember that wondrous birth. The Bible there says, and his fame went throughout How well does his fame go throughout your family? How well does his fame go throughout your workplace? How well does his fame go throughout your neighborhood? How well does his fame go throughout? As you as a believer in Jesus Christ, if you're here this morning, you're saved. As you go about telling folks about your wonderful Savior. In just a few days, the trees will come down. The wreaths will come off the walls and the doors. They always do. They'll go back in their boxes. Go back in the storage room. The Christmas cards will go into a box of mementos and maybe put in a cedar chest or find their way in a drawer. They'll come down from the walls and the mantles. And it'll be forgotten about. But the next tree that we'll talk about is less than four months away. And that Sunday will be April the 12th. And we'll tell folks about another tree. Didn't have lights. Lights. Had one light. The light of the world. Didn't have ornaments. Angels. Stars. Christmas bones. One ornament. The Son of God. We won't talk about a manger. Where he was laid. We'll talk about a grave. Where he was laid. Thank God three days later he got up. And that's why the story continues. So if we want his fame to go throughout all of Thomasville, Davidson County, in North Carolina, it only happens if we go about. And we've got to go where they are. We've built our buildings. We've put on our programs. We've hired our pulpiteers and our professionals. Just to be blunt, that's a little bit backwards. We're supposed to go to them. So if there is a spring days this year, we're going to be there. I'll go ahead and let you know. The information booth at everybody's day comes to life again this year. We go to where they are. And we tell them about a Savior and a story that we believe in. That our faith rests in. And that our hopes are settled in. Now, if you're here this morning, you've never been saved, we want to invite you to come and be a part of us. Not Park Place Baptist Church but of the church of Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you're saved, I want you to rededicate yourself, commit yourself to going about with the story of Jesus Christ because the story, till we hear the trumpet, continues.